Chris Culp. I'm an associate professor of theology at the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, and I'm also dean of the Disciples Divinity House at the University of Chicago. And I'm going to talk about Dorothy Day's The Long Loneliness, which is subtitled an autobiography, but as we'll find out, she's not entirely happy with that term. You may know her name because she's been in the news a lot. She's in the canonization process for the Catholic Church uh, and was especially in the news with uh, Pope Francis's visit lately. But, but this text stands on its own and I wanna talk about why we should pay attention to it. What's the context of this text? Dorothy Day was a co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement and she didn't like the language of saint. In fact, she said, don't call me a saint. She also didn't really like the language of autobiography, which one might guess her publisher gave to this text. Um, instead, she said it was a conversion story, and the language that she uses at the beginning of the book is that it's a confession. But let me back up a little bit and tell you about when it was published was published in 1952, which is right at the height of the McCarthy era in the US, a time of, of fear, a time of political reactionary uh, movements, um, and a time of denunciation of the Communist Party and of uh, anyone who might in some way be affiliated with that. Uh, Dorothy Day, um, who was a radical in her time and in founding the Catholic Worker Movement, understood and appreciated the radical movements of her day, um, wasn't afraid to be tarred a communist, although she wasn't one. Uh, she put on the banner of the Catholic Worker paper, we are un-American, she said, we are Catholic. Um, and I want to dig into a little bit about what in the world that means because what she sought her whole life was a synthesis between the Catholic faith and activism, especially on behalf of the poor, but also against the war, um, for, against racism. Let me tell you a little bit about Dorothy Day and then we'll um, dive into the text. She was born in 1897. She lived until she was 83. She died in 1980. Um, this book, is, if you do the math quickly, was published in 1952. She was about 55 when she wrote this book. She'd had a, a substantive career, but, but she had 30 more years of her life. She spent some of her formative years right here in Chicago, and that's an interesting angle on the text. Uh, but she spent the most part of her life in New York City. Um, that's where she met poverty at its direst, and she, she met it in the, at the beginning of the Great Depression. The Catholic Worker Movement is founded in 1933. Um, FDR's uh, social uh, policies really are only getting underway there, and she sees the dearth of response and the need for simply a good cup of coffee and a good loaf of bread to eat. What are some key themes? We know Dorothy Day for her heroic social faith. Um, at the time, she was marginal to the Roman Catholic Church of her day. She was a Catholic laywoman, a convert to Catholicism. And part of this narrative in, that the book gives is about her conversion to Catholicism. However, that's not the only conversion that she goes through. Her primary conversion could be understood as a conversion to the poor. Uh, but as she says, what she's really seeking is a synthesis of attention to the poor, analysis of the poor, activism on behalf of the poor, and a Catholic faith. She wonders, where are the saints to change the Catholic order? That's a question she formulates early in her life before her conversion to Catholicism. And it's a question that haunts her um, for many years and that haunts the narrative as well. 
It's 1952. Uh, it's before the Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church. All Catholic masses are said in Latin. All nuns and brothers are in their Catholic garb. And one of the things that you would find in any Catholic church was a confessional. Um, a confessional that the parishioners would line up to visit um, every Saturday night. And that's where the book opens. We find ourselves the reader in the midst of a confessional. Think about why, why she puts us here for when the book starts. When you go to confession on a Saturday night, you go into a warm, dimly lit vastness with the smell of wax and incense in the air, the smell of burning candles, and if it is a hot summer night, there is the sound of a great electric fan and the noise of the streets coming in to emphasize the stillness. So you've heard, she's cued the lights, she's cued the sound. What are we doing? We're, we're, our attention is attuned, and we're in that little box of a confessional with her. She says, some confessionals are large and roomy, plenty of space for the knees, and breathing space in the thick darkness that seems to pulse with your own heart. Why does she want to put her reader there? She writes this book for Harper and Rowe. It's not written for a Catholic audience. In fact, Harper and Rowe suspects that the book is too parochial for its reader's taste. But she continues, and she says, going to confession is hard. Um, she, she gives us the, the text of the ritual that she would confess in a confessional. And we wonder, what, what kind of book is this going to be? Why are we here in the confessional? Well, it turns out that she doesn't want us to confess what she calls our ugly, drab, gray, monotonous sins. She wants us to attune ourselves to a different kind of confessional. And she says, what I want to write about is all the good and beautiful things that there are, all the remembrances of, of God that have led me to God. Uh, but she gives it another layer too. So she's, she's already first saying confession isn't only about confessing sin. It's not only something that's given to a hierarchical church. It's not only something that's formulaic, but, but it does have a ritual context and that's important. She also reminds us indirectly of St. Augustine's Confession, um, his turn of the fifth century book that is understood at one level to have been the first autobiography that's written. Augustine says in the opening of his text, my heart is restless till it finds rest in thee. Now, Dorothy Day, we know that there's a certain restlessness already from her title. It's the long loneliness. It's not the long restlessness, but it's this long sense of yearning. And her opening uh, pages tell us that we should pay attention to that parallel to Augustine, too. Um, Augustine's text is a conversion story as well, not just one conversion, but many conversions. Um, through forms of, of thought, through different practices, and there's a constant turning and turning. It gives us a glimpse that what we might read in Dorothy Day's book is also a kind of constant turning and seeking, and in fact it is. Day says that it's hard to tell the truth, and that's also at the heart of this being a confession. It is hard to write what needs to be written, and not to tell of all the experiences that she has had, but to tell of what's brought her to the truth, to tell a true thing about the pilgrimage of her own life. Uh, the book is, is set up in many ways parallel to the structure of Augustine's Confessions. It follows a chronological narrative that begins in the very early part of her life, and um, then 
its last part, like Augustine's Confessions, turns a different direction. So we have two thirds of a book here from Dorothy Day about her life, and the final third of the book makes an interesting turn. It turns to the Catholic worker. So in some sense, we have an autobiography of Dorothy Day and an autobiography of the Catholic worker movement. Um, it's important though that she tells the story of her life because she's invited us into her life just in the same way she invites us into that confessional. She doesn't want to tell us though about all she's experienced. She wants to, as she's done in that confessional, attune our attention, attune our consciousness to the things that have delighted her and troubled her, and that's especially to the poor. The poor are such an important theme of this text and of her life. She says that in one simple formation of the Catholic worker, that it's to be poor with the poor. Um, at the point of the Great Depression where uh, uh, much of this book takes place, the poor are not only those who are homeless and without work, they are the destitute. Um, and Dorothy Day knows that to be poor with the poor doesn't mean that the Catholic worker can divest themselves of their lives or what they are, but it does mean that they can adapt a way of being in the world that allows them to, to be attuned to the poor, and not only the poor as needy, there's a theme throughout this book of a kind of sacramentalism, and the poor are the sacrament of God in Dorothy Day's book. The poor are the ones who invite her finally to this conversion to God and the wholeness of God. There are other themes that run all the way through the book, the poor and the unity of loves. We also wanna look at um, community and what she says about the Catholic worker itself. Uh, the book is structured in three main parts. The first part is called searching. The second is natural happiness. And the third is love is the measure. The third is the part where she talks about the founding of the Catholic worker movement in 1933. And it's organized around the different aspects of the Catholic worker. The first two parts are much more autobiographical in the way that we might expect that. I know when I first read the book, I kept waiting for the book to culminate in the picture of this um, practical saint, Dorothy Day. And I was surprised when the book took a turn to this narrative about the Catholic worker. That's a similar kind of surprise that we might have if we're reading Augustine's Confessions when he turns at the end to contemplate memory. And it goes to the theology that undergirds a lot of this text. We've started with Augustine and we've started with the restlessness and this dynamism of reaching for God and searching for God and searching for a rest that comes out of that quest for God. But Dorothy Day finally doesn't organize her book in that way, and she finally makes a turn to the theology of Thomas Aquinas rather than Augustine. She introduces the language of synthesis, and she is agitated by not being able to hold together the good of the social order with a sense of human response to God. We get a, a foretaste of what that synthesis must be like if it's adequate at a, from a very, very early um, point in her life. Her family lives in San Francisco um, and we um, find ourselves with Dorothy at a young age um, with her house being um, shook by the earthquake as it happens. Um, they flee their home, their home is destroyed. But what she tells us about is not first how horrible it is, although we know that. 
She tells us about this memory that she has of how people responded to the earthquake. They move in common rhythm, as it were, to respond to the need that is so evident around them. That is an early clue, maybe the earliest clue in the whole book, of what she's looking for. Where is that kind of sense of response to human dignity and need that comes naturally, as it were, out of a recognition of what we can do to respond to that. When we get to the section on Catholic worker, we have another theme that articulates that, which is glimpsed so early on, and that is a sense that's borrowed from the IWW slogan via a Thomistic sense of the common good. And that is that we need a society in which it is easier to be good. It's a society that's structured and able to respond to the need that's human and genuine. We need a society where, like in the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, people are able to move in common rhythm to the need that is abundantly clear to Dorothy Day at the height of the Great Depression that should be abundantly clear to anyone who sees it. But she also wants that response to be not only the response of radical political movements, but the response of a religious movement. How to hold those two together? She, she as a young adult, um, Puts, puts herself in with the radical movements of the day, with the socialists, the communists. In fact, there's a chapter in the book where she basically gives us a glossary of all of the radical movements of her day. She has moved to New York City as a 20-year-old young woman, as a journalist, and she writes for those papers. Um, she, by her own admission, lives a wild life, a life on the wild side. She's a, Eugene O'Neill is her lover. She hangs out with the radicals. She, um, she has a good time, but she keeps being haunted by the fact that that's only half of the synthesis she's looking for. She's looking for the synthesis that meets this felt religious uh, movement that's, that's haunted her from her early days. Her narrative tells us about some of those moments when she catches a glimpse of her neighbors praying and wants to be like them but doesn't really understand them. She's born an Episcopalian and does not convert to the Catholic Church um, unt until she's in her mid-twenties. And it's not an easy move to that either. Um, that takes us to the middle part of the book. The middle part of the book, which is, which is titled Natural Happiness, um, has some echoes of that Thomistic theology as well, this sense of happiness that is part of nature. Um, it's already grace nature at that point, but, but Dorothy Day doesn't find that happiness through the church or with a theological name. She finds it with her lover while she's living on Stanton Island, and she rejoices in Forster Batterham's love of the sea, her love of him, their common law marriage, um, and all the goodness that love of another human being brings her. But it's not enough quite yet. Um, she becomes pregnant. Um, she doesn't expect to be because she's had an abortion as a young adult and doesn't think she'd be able to have a child. Um, she doesn't write about the abortion in the book, but it's an important background and it's also in the news. Um, it's covered in the space of all of one sentence in the narrative itself, but its contrast is there in the middle part of the book in the love and delight she finds in finding herself pregnant with her daughter and in receiving her daughter into the world. And she's so moved by this happiness, this natural happiness, that she finds herself wanting to pray 
to give thanks to that and to locate her natural happiness in some bigger sense of happiness. One of the most lyrical passages in the book is when she writes about her love for Forster, her common law spouse. She says, I loved him for all he knew and pitied him for all he didn't know. I loved him for the odds and ends. I had to fish out of his sweater pockets and for the sand and shells he brought in with his fishing. I loved his lean, cold body as he got into bed smelling of the sea, and I loved his integrity and stubborn pride. Now, earlier in the book, she tells us about Augustine and his sense of love and how that love finally has to be abandoned for a higher love in God. Dorothy Day, I think, tells us something a little different in this text. She says, this love, this natural happiness is good. It is an indication of what's good. Just like that response to the San Francisco earthquake is a real indication of what's good. But how does that relate to a sense of, of love of God and of life that, that is directed ultimately toward God? Well, for, for Dorothy Day, um, the highest part of love is not the abandonment of love for the love of God, but it's the unity of love, um, mother love, love of friends, sexual love in love of God. Um, she says at one point uh, in her diaries, I am not a Neoplatonist. She does not think that the goodness of this world has to be conquered um, to be real in God. She thinks that there is a way in which the goodness and joy of this life, the goodness and joy of bodies and places and the smell of the sea can be united in a love of God. But the narrative takes a turn at this point and she finds that she she's, has to leave Forster to become a member of the church. And we're tempted to read the book as though she, like other, um, other visions of religious life, has to negate the love for the love of God. But I think that's not really what she's telling us. She's saying that she's looking for a faith, a vision of the love of God that's big enough to hold all of these other forms of love. And for her, she can't do that while staying with Forster because he's an agnostic. He's a practical guy. He doesn't, he's not interested in her um, interest in the Catholic Church and what he sees as its dusty old rituals. Those rituals, though, compel Dorothy Day. We know that. We were in the confessional with her. And um, she has to put those together. And so the book finally finds um, its uh, final movement when the Catholic worker movement is founded. Um, Dorothy Day has gone to Washington, D.C. in 1932 to cover a, a hunger march there. And she wonders, where are the Catholics here? Everyone else has gathered um, at the beginning of the Great Depression before Franklin Delano Roosevelt has put all of the social policies in place, and she doesn't see Catholics there and wonders where are they. By that point, she's a member of the church. She thinks that this church, which is the Church of Immigrants, ought to be attentive to the needs of the poor. It's the working people who fill the pews of the immigrant Catholic churches that she worships in. Where are they? She returns from this march to find this man at her doorstep named Peter Marin. Um, he's a theorist. He offers some ideas um, that come from Thomas Aquinas and a sense of the, the common good, the, the value of the common good. He also has a whole program that he sketches out for her. And uh, that includes agronomic universities and houses of welcome and writing a paper. Um, Dorothy Day, of course, is a journalist and she knows how to do that. As she says, Peter um, 
uh, disposes and she picks up the work and um, does it. She finds a way to take a first step into this social program, to this, um, this practical response that is profoundly rooted in Catholic theology um, and that is profoundly attuned to the needs of the poor. Um, the first Catholic Worker paper, which is the beginning of the Catholic Worker movement, is published in 1933. She turns in um, the money that she's earned from a couple writing assignments and um, is able to find a way to get this paper printed. She does that, that's the beginning of this movement. The name Catholic Worker um, comes partly um, in conversation with another paper that's handed out on the streets of New York City, The Daily Worker. It's the paper of the Communist Party. But she says, no, it should be The Catholic Worker. Um, and here you get a glimpse in the title itself of where the synthesis is going to come about. It's Catholic and it's the worker. As soon as she starts to write, people who need something to eat show up on the doorstep. Um, and so they begin to serve um, good coffee and good bread um, and meals. The Catholic houses of hospitality, the Catholic worker houses of hospitality, are founded shortly thereafter. Um, these are lay communities. They're not intentional communities exactly. She will often tell us how long someone's lived at the Catholic Worker. Um, they don't take vows to live there, uh, but they, they do share what they have and they share abundantly with the poor. Um, they also uh, create um, not Peter Maurin's agronomic universities, but a number of farms and efforts on the land that will integrate their, um, their sense of living simply um, and tie that back to the land and what's provided. And then another piece of the Catholic Worker we learn in the last pages of this narrative um, are the retreats where, where there is a more explicit theology and a more explicit spirituality that's cultivated. But getting hold of that program itself doesn't fully tell us about the Catholic worker. Um, the, the last part of the book is structured so that we know what those pieces are, but, but that's not really the story that Dorothy Day tells us. She tells us about these numerous people who come through the doors there. They are um, in a way of saying they're saints themselves. And she tells us about these unconventional saints. She also tells us about the rituals that populate their days. And she goes to mass every day. They practice um, the rituals of the church, but there are also the rituals of um, of sharing coffee together, of sharing bread together, of, of getting the paper out. Um, and, and this picture comes together richly. She says, I'm not a saint, but she tunes our attention to the saints who live on the streets in her midst. She is a lay Catholic, but she lives in the rhythms of the church. Um, she looks um, to hold those two together. How has this text informed me? Dorothy Day's book um, asks us to uh, consider not her experiences, but her consciousness, her conscience about the poor. Uh, it's, it is something that we're invited into as a reader, and I, and I like teaching this book because it's, it's teaching to read the world along with her to see the world as she sees the world. I, I admit the first few times of, of reading this book, I didn't love this book. Um, but now I've read it at least once every year for the last dozen years or so. And, um, and that way of seeing the world is powerful because it doesn't let us stop at just seeing the world. We have to accompany her um, in action 
um, to change the world. It's, it's kind of an irony for me, and I keep thinking about this, that someone would write an autobiography to motivate engagement in social change. Why would we look at one person's life um, to be invited into um, thinking about um, a broader social movement and how, uh, how we are engaged with the poor who are so still in our midst? Um, what, what could that look like? Um, I, I read Dorothy Day's text often in relation to Malcolm X's autobiography, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and he says he writes that book um, as a testimony that he hopes will be of some social value. I love to teach this book because they are both profound testimonies of social value and help tutor us, the readers, in how to see and how to thematize that social value um, with the most radical of activists and with the most profound of theological and spiritual insight, that synthesis that Day wanted to have herself. What more can you read about this? There are many sources if you want to learn more about Dorothy Day. And some, some are videos and there are many secondary sources about her. But I would suggest that, that one of the best ways to follow up on this is to read other um, self-writing, pieces of self-writing, and to think about self-writing. What does it mean to, to reflect on conscience and consciousness instead? Um, pick, pick up Augustine's Confessions again. Pick up an autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, you might want to read Paul Ricoeur, or One Self is Another. Um, and then you can also read some more of Dorothy Day. Her, her diaries are published, her writing is published, and all of those things are on the catholicworker.org website. Um, there's, a, there's an abundance of riches and many ways of engaging this. Don't only think about reading it as her life, but think about the work that self-writing itself can do in attuning our attention and consciousness to the needs and dignity of others. The long loneliness doesn't go away at the end of the book, but Dorothy Day closes the book with a powerful postscript on what is finally at the end. The most significant thing about the Catholic worker is poverty, some say. And the most significant thing is community, others say. We are not alone anymore. But the final word is love. At times it has been in the words of Father Zosima, a harsh and dreadful thing, and our very faith in love has been tried through fire. We cannot love God unless we love each other, and to love we must know each other. We know God in the breaking of bread, and we know each other in the breaking of bread, and we are not alone anymore. Heaven is a banquet, and life is a banquet, too, even with a crust where there is companionship. <laughs>